Hey everybody, I'm James Hodge and today Kelly Morrissey and I will be presenting on behalf of the other collaborators who helped structure this paper about how other socially orientated researchers can learn from ethics in dementia research. Now for this presentation, Kelly's going to go over the motivation behind this study and discuss why researchers can learn from the dementia context and we'll also delve into our methodology for the study. And finally, I'll end the talk by unpacking some of those lessons learned from, the, from this community of practice that can be applied to the wider HCI community. In recent years, we've seen an increased interest in HCI and in technology design and deployment more generally in how we understand and teach ethical sensibilities. HCI researchers in particular have been reflecting on the ethical challenges they face throughout the research process through venues such as town halls and conference workshops at ACM venues. A parallel but related stream of interest here has arisen in working with participants in sensitive contexts or who might be termed vulnerable. Despite how useful these conversations have been, we feel we often miss an understanding of how researchers in a diverse array of contexts handle ethical decisions. A lot of the conversations which happen in these workshops and town halls are ephemeral, sometimes necessarily so, and not everyone can afford to attend. In this study, we take design ethics in dementia and HCI research as a case study to reflect and to elucidate wider concerns about ethics in HCI research. So dementia is a neurodegenerative condition that affects people differently. It often involves changes to short-term memory, orientation and decision-making and results in an increased need for care. As well as being a well-studied area in HCI, from assistive living technologies to technologies which aim to augment and improve quality of life, dementia is a useful case to study in terms of ethics. In HCI, work related to dementia is ethically complicated due to the nature of the condition. Informed consent is arguably difficult to attain when the participant's memory or verbal ability is waning, and family members are often either reticent to get involved or often absent entirely. In terms of technology and design, some of the most ethically grey technologies are deployed in dementia care almost uncritically, e.g. trackers, alarms and other surveillance tech. Therefore, you can see that whether in everyday care or in the academic literature, the person with dementia is often positioned as a passive patient whose dementia must be treated rather than understood, with little consideration given to their agency or to their need for a continued sense of purpose and belonging. In response to the medicalization of the experience of dementia, person-centered approaches have highlighted the need for socially oriented care, in which the individual is positioned central to their care. This approach informs recent work in HCI and dementia, which focuses on in-the-moment meaning-making as the basis of design. Influenced by these shifts in care thinking, HCI researchers have sought to design technologies that evoke emotion, creativity and inclusion by working with and advocating for people living with dementia, mirroring a similar shift in design and social care more generally. However, ethical practice in designing for dementia is often further shaped by ethical review boards or E or Bs, which can sometimes misunderstand dementia and or technology research. The ethical principles applied by ERBs often reflect the philosophical basis of morality and established codes of conduct shaped by culture and society. So while these ethical guidelines set a course for research that seeks to ensure both the participant and the research institute are informed and protected, many prominent interdisciplinary research approaches such as participatory design and qualitative work with vulnerable populations in HCI can be considered ethically questionable by ERBs. Bell argues that many ERBs approaches to ethics align more with the biomedical and experimental scientific methods, which themselves fail to reflect the multiple ways of generating knowledge that encompass the third wave of HCI. The introduction of technology and design has further ethical implications within sensitive design contexts. For example, technology may bring expectations of significant and lasting improvement to quality of life. Prototypes and early design probes are liable to break, and technologies have implications for data storage and privacy. In addition to technology and design, 
Participatory methods, which have long been a central part of HCI work, are facing significant questioning by ERBs and other governing bodies, where discomfort with qualitative or social constructionist methods can clash with harder questions of computer science and engineering. And against this sec sensitive backdrop, and with respect and admiration for these researchers engaged in working with people with dementia in a more humanistic manner, we were curious about how these other researchers in design and dementia feel about the role of ethics in their work, in terms of both institutional ethics and the everyday ethics of speaking with or relating to other people who are experiencing challenging circumstances. Interested in the tacit and unstated practices that researchers employed in working with people living with dementia and their carers, we undertook a reflective qualitative approach to carrying out this empirical research. Mindful that we are about to engage with a large number of researchers across several disciplines and on sensitive topics, we adopted the reflexive position of connected knowing, which recognizes disagreement or disparity between viewpoints, but adopts a strategy of empathy instead of judgment or argument. Participants were 22, 12 women and 10 men, self-identified designers and or researchers who reported significant experience in working with people living with dementia in the design of technologies and services. Participants were recruited through purposive sampling methods, advised in cases where we seek to access a particular subset of people, as all participants of a study are selected because they fit a similar profile. We iteratively developed a semi-structured interview schedule with five of the authors carrying out these interviews, and all interviews were audio recorded and transcribed. Using a thematic analysis approach, we utilized multiple coders within the research team in order to avoid bias. After a multi-stage coding process detailed in our paper in full, we identified two overarching themes with multiple sub-themes. Now, if you've had the chance to read our paper, you'll know that while our findings reflect on the careful ethical considerations required when working with people living with dementia, they are based in this relational and everyday ethics. So with that being said, for the rest of this presentation, I want to unpack some of those lessons learned from working in dementia that can be applied to the wider HCI community. For those who work in socially orientated research areas, it's of course quite common to write ethics forms that are typically reviewed by ethical review boards. And these committees are in place to ensure that research is following those standard ethical principles to protect the participants, the researchers, and also the research institutions. And from the researchers that we interviewed, it highlighted the range of experiences with ERBs that were quite tied to those geographical and cultural contexts. So one of the researchers, Verna, she shared insights into studies in Singapore where ERBs often consider technology that's implemented into care homes to be more of a medical device. And this biomedical lens caused tension for researchers who may be looking at ways technology can be used in engaging activities, where the research has more to do with the individual instead of their diagnosis. And Verna wasn't the only one who had difficulties with this, uh, where ERBs perceived ethics as this one size fits all. Isla talked about these struggles uh, when trying to work on an application to recruit from the NHS care homes to be part of a low risk qualitative design study. And in the end, the ethics was refused based on the review board who couldn't see the benefits of involvement. And the ERBs instead focused on the need for protection instead of inclusion. And overall, researchers expressed a want for a mutual relationship with these ethical review boards, a relationship where researchers could seek support, advice, and collaborate in a more discursive manner, instead of being judged for their ethical practices. And beyond this, researchers expressed the freedom to pursue and maintain relationships with participants, something that felt contested during and post-research. And the maintaining for those relationships uh, form tension where protection hinders that of acknowledgement of participants' contributions. So it's quite common when working in sensitive settings to anonymise the participants through the use of blown faces, pseudonyms, to actually ensure that data cannot be traced back to that participant. And many, if not all, researchers expressed an understanding of respect and safety for these principles to be in place. However, some of the researchers felt that this ends up being more about staying within the university's insurance and less about avoiding harm to participants. 
And whether this is true, researchers found difficulties when participants may want their real name to be used and to actually be acknowledged and recognised for their contributions. And several researchers in the past have included people living with dementia as authors to actually recognise their contributions. So one of the researchers we interviewed, Enzio, he talked about an institution that hired participants to be research collaborators and they were also given authorship in the publications that follow. And recognising that participants can be part of that authorship can actually push towards individuals within that community influencing that research agenda. However, while this means researchers and institutions are considering ways to involve participants in numerous ways, we do need to consider how venues may change their code of authorship to be more inclusive to non-academics. So, for example, the ACM states that authors must have participated in drafting and or revision of the manuscript. However, participants may not be able to write or verbally communicate, but we should actually acknowledge communication through other means such as the body. And from what we've discussed, it was apparent that many researchers felt that the ethical application process needs to be developed further. And this poses a question for us researchers, and that is, what can researchers do to ensure ERBs are more dynamic and reflexive uh, when evaluating research that seeks to design or innovate in sensitive settings? And if we are increasingly engaging in socially oriented research, then perhaps so should ERBs. And many researchers often found themselves on that outside perspective when conducting research, and we may not actually be aligning our research agendas as closely to the population as we could be doing. So take this Dementia Network uh, project, for example, called Dementia Inquiries. And this network is run by advocates and people living with dementia who come up with their own research studies and they have their own ethics guidelines. And by working with networks similar to these or considering ways participants are contributing to the entirety of the research project, we can perhaps ensure research designs become rooted in participant-led agendas that can actually contribute to more ethically engaged research. And by involving the community alongside the ERB, we could make institutional research articulate the interests and priorities of the individuals the research will impact. But for this to happen, Researchers must consider how we can create tools that promote conversation and inclusion of community members, along with how we can communicate our research processes to participants and also ERBs. Finally, I want to discuss what impact can mean in research, as this was varied across the participants we interviewed. So for some, the impact comes from developing successful spin-offs to sustain research. Kevin suggested that by involving business Lincolns when writing grants, you can still position participants at the forefront of research and consider ways to have technology outlast the study's timeline. But involving participants may mitigate the problems that participants may fall into, such as software updates or new features that eventually become to a halt. This only remains successful if it seems profitable. While for others, the impact can be from the relationships and moments created during research, uh, as opposed to the actual technology that's created. So Emily was expressed in her research uh, becoming a significant event to the participants when they were placed as the focal point who drove the research, where they had photos of the project in their home post the research study. And Emily remarks that technology doesn't have to be this cutting edge to be meaningful and to do something poetic and powerful. And in this way, it's quite clear that researchers should consider that technology alone does not hold any value, but it's the relationships and experiences that it creates. And as we begin to move towards more inclusive design, we should continue to question the infrastructures that surround and often hold up our own work. And in this small talk, we want researchers to start questioning how we can ensure ethical review boards are more reflexive and dynamic when they are evaluating research that seeks to design in sensitive settings, and how we can engage with the community from the very start of the research to ensure research is actually rooted in the participant-led agendas. Thank you for listening, and if you found this talk interesting, check out our paper that discusses what we've said in a lot more detail alongside topics of reflective practice, designing for technology's end of life, and further insights into navigating the ongoing ethical challenges through research. Uh, That's it for now. Uh, Stay safe. Thank you.